it moves. He can't break through this pond block. <laughs> so I'm just going to waste my time moving back and forth. Here. Gentlemen, hi. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm going to take a different approach in giving my presentation and actually talk. <laughs> I, so, so, so taking this tactic comes from a, a threefold approach. One, I'm funded by NASA, which means every month I turn in monthly reports in the form of PowerPoint quad charts. I turn in periodic nuggets in the form of PowerPoint slides. I have developed a deeply honed hatred of the slide deck and an understanding that there are are better ways. And, and so when I normally do presentations, I first of all use keynote, because it's at least not PowerPoint. And there are no words in what I do. And in trying to illustrate this particular slide deck, I got about a third of the way through and realized I hated half my images, and I stopped. So I'm going to let your minds fill in the pictures. And hopefully we can all go someplace together in our heads while talking together in this room. I, my, my preceding speakers have all given themselves a brief introduction. Um, I, I'd like to start by saying there is one small typo in the program. If you read the paragraphs, they're correct, but I'm not currently at the University of Texas. I, I'm actually uh, the Director of Technology and Citizen Science for the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, and I'm located in southern Illinois, and I'm aware that makes no sense. But it is much cheaper in southern Illinois than in San Francisco, where our headquarters is. So when they hired my entire research team, they asked us to please stay where we were, because it was easier to afford us that way. And we happen to like living there. Uh, so my background is, is one that is a mix of technology, of science, and I've been doing this forever. I was a weird small child. I started doing astronomy before most people start doing more than reading fairy tales. I was instead reading mytho mythology and fascinated with the fact that the constellations are named after the myths and then seeing yesterday the rocks in Jaffa that Andromeda was theoretically tied to. Um, it's all a story. And sometimes the stories we fall in love with as children carry us interesting places. And when I was 15, I was invited to be part of a group of students from the United States who went to the Soviet Union to study at the Six Meter Telescope for a summer. And we were young, and we thought we knew everything in that way that only clever teenagers can think that they truly knew everything. One of the highlights of that trip was traveling up into the mountains and visiting that peak where the Soviet six meter telescope was located. At the time, this was the largest telescope in the world and it was built in many ways as a temple to science. You enter the building and the, the base of the dome is all stained glass. A picture of all of the zodiacal symbols wrapped around the giant pier that supports the telescope. And as we went up in that dome, we, we were invited to sign our names to the wall that, that they record the names of visitors on. And, and to do that as teenagers, writing our names next to the names of some of the greatest astronomers of our time, it, it was this amazing experience. And, and at the end of this night, we were taking the bus down the mountain, and we, we were too drunk on being alive to even consider sleep. And, and on that bus trip, we considered all of those 4 AM questions that I think all of us at some point or another have discussed with our friends. Those, where did we come from? Where did the universe come from? How will our world end? How will our universe end? Is there life out there among the stars?
And back when we were having these discussions in 1989, we didn't have answers to these questions. We didn't have Google. Big data was in the field of astronomy, six data points. And, and in this age before laptops, before so many different things, we had to make up our answers based on our understandings of, of physics, based on our religious ideas and our lack of religious ideas, depending on who on the bus you were talking with. And we didn't know if in our lifetimes any of these questions could be answered with data. And like Aristotelian philosophers, we decided to take an approach that from first principles, we would argue for one way that the universe should end over another, and we would rely on, on thought experiments. When we were teens, it was a different time. We had been children who were allowed to wander free. Uh, as long as we came home by dark, our, our parents would tell us, stay on this block. And like disobedient, normal little children, we'd take off and we'd go miles from home, go to the corner store, which, because I lived in a small town, was miles away, and buy candy. And when our parents ask, where were you? You didn't come when I called. We lie and say we were up in the top of a tree and just couldn't hear. As teenagers, we'd say we were going to the mall and we'd really be going into the city of Boston. We weren't bad children. We just knew that there was a world out there to explore. And without the internet, we went out and we explored. This lack of data, it gave us freedom. It, it let us imagine, and we ran wild in the world, and in our minds we dreamed, and we pretended, and we escaped. The world has changed in the 30 years since that summer. That six-meter telescope is nowhere near the largest telescope in the world anymore. Um, and, and we don't explore to discover anymore. We don't ask 4 a.m. questions in the same way. Things are now graspable with data. They're solved with data. And, and just as data has made our world smaller, it has also, through technology, tethered us. Um, I can't disappear for a day. People can figure out where I am because I have a cell phone. Children today. They can't run away and tell their parents they climbed a tree when in reality they were off buying candy because their parents can look at their cell phone and see where they were. We've changed. And, and as a scientist, this explosion of information is, is absolutely amazing. Uh, I, as an armchair sociologist, I also find it terrifying, though. This idea that we are always tethered, we are always monitored. Data can be used for good and it can be used for evil. And it can also strip us of how we dream. It's this idea of creativity that you are bringing up. Let's consider the life and death of our universe for a moment. Uh, when, when I was a young college student, we, we used to say there's three possible ways that the universe will end. Um, we used to say it, it might be fire, it might be ice, depending on, on how we consider it. We can measure now the cosmic microwave background radiation. We can look out with the Planck satellite and we can determine the actual age of our universe is 13.82 billion years old. We can look out and say this isn't our only line of evidence. We can study the atomic compositions in stars and see in the ratios of elements, ratios that map out to what you would expect from Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And we see that expansion. We, we even see in looking at that Planck data, 
we can see how the early universe act, acted like a cavity with sound waves oscillating through it. And we can start to get at the geometry of space and time. We are answering all the detailed questions of how did we get from time zero to how did we get to now. In looking at the composition of the stars, we, we can keep mapping things out in greater and greater detail. Um, we can use techniques not too different from radiocarbon dating. Nuclear cosmochemistry is its unfortunately long-winded name. And this is a process of looking at the stars and very carefully measuring the nuclear isotopic ratios. This is about the most boring form of science. You can participate in doing this. And I say this as someone who had the misfortune of measuring magnesium hydride isotopic ratios in main sequence stars as part of my graduate work. This basically means that I spent two years of my life looking at the difference between this magnesium hydride band of lines, this li band of lines using the 107-inch telescope at McDonald Observatory. And you think using a giant telescope isolated out in the darkness brings you closer to, to heaven, closer to God. Sometimes it brings you closer to wanting to throw your computer out a window. This is part of why I show you no pictures. <laughs> but once you're done measuring all of these line sizes, line ratios, you can start to get at information. You can start to realize that our galaxy, which is younger than the entire universe as it should be, we didn't know this when I started graduate school. We actually had debates where it appeared that some of the globular clusters were actually older than the entire universe, which was a problem, which we solved by looking at more things and looking at them better. And now we know that the disk of our galaxy is about 9 billion years old. We know that our own sun is about 4.97 billion years old. And all of this fits together. And when we build our models of our 13.8 billion year old universe, we can watch in our models the universe go from this place where the slight over densities and under densities of matter that were created by those sound waves reverberating through the early universe. Those slight over and under densities led to the stars, to the galaxies, to the large scale structure we see today. And it all matches over the fullness of time. What we do in a computer, what we see with our telescopes. The universe is not old. It is ancient. And, and this can be problematic when we're trying to teach science to people of faith. There, there are those who would call me a liar when I talk about the age of our universe. There are those who would say my science is false and that my words come from the devil. And, and we have to talk to these people with compassion. And compassion is often the hardest part of what we do when we bring science and religion together. In 2009, I, I was part of a debate between old universe scientists and young, a young one, young earth creationist scientist. It was me, Don York, Bill Keel, Hugh Ross on the side of the Big Bang. And it was Danny Faulkner defending creationism. And we were all astronomers. And we were there to discuss the science of what we see and what we understand. This, this was no Ken Ham versus Bill Nye debate where both of us were there to shame one another and try and prove we are right in a clear hunger for publicity. We, we were all Christians. We were all scientists. And we were trying to argue from a point of compassion. Throughout the day, we, we sat in a soundstage studio debating different elements of creation, debating different elements of Big Bang cosmology. And then we would go to break, and we would share meals, and we would pray together. And I learned something that day that broke my heart. 
I learned that there are those out there whose faith is so inflexible that like a glass put under pressure, it can hold substantial weight, but because it can't bend, it will break if the weight gets to be too much. And I realized that this man that we debated, this young earth creationist, to him the idea that it was a literal seven day creation and that it was a literal number, six days and one of rest, fine. I hear you whispering in the audience, fine. It's all right. This idea of a literal creation where you can count the generations and you can argue over lost years, lost generations here and there. You can argue over what it really meant for different people to live for different amounts. That to this person who still felt our Earth is thousands of years old, I realized we couldn't bring him an understanding of an old universe without taking away his understanding of God. He, he had built his faith on a brittle foundation. And it was all of a single piece. It, it, I hurt for him because he could only allow a partial truth. He could only allow that there is a God, but he could not allow the full truth that there is a God so great as to create a potentially limited, limitless universe shaped so perfectly as to make our lives possible as the universe evolved and grew, as our galaxy formed, as our sun formed, and as our Earth allowed us to eventually form as well. The more data humanity collects, the more we're going to challenge people's beliefs. This is both the power of big data and it also brings a potential social revolution. For science to win the battle, we must argue from a place of compassion. We must remind people that it would be a cruel God indeed who tried to explain to a pre-literate society how our galaxy arose using general relativity and quantum mechanics. The, the people who recorded our earliest stories of creation didn't fully have the concept of zero down mathematically. They didn't have physics. They didn't have the idea of experimentation and science beyond farmers clearly knew how to figure out how to get the hay to dry faster before they fed it to the cows. We knew about experiments, but we didn't know about science. And this always brings me to this one line from Corinthians. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put away the, the ways of childhood behind me. There's this idea that as a species, we are growing. We had our childhood, and we needed a story for that childhood to allow us to understand where we came from. We don't explain where children come from in intimate detail to our youngest children. We give them hints when a mommy and a daddy love one another, and then we move on from there. Occasionally, you do meet the people who go into a little bit too much detail and you worry for their children's sanity, but we tell stories that are comprehensible. We, as humans, have the ability to comprehend our universe, but not all at once. It is over generations. It is over book after book after journal after journal of building upon one another's understandings that we come to understand our universe. And what we as scientists, who are often trained, hopefully, that when the data doesn't fit, our understanding, we need to change our understanding to incorporate that data. We, we are trained to throw out what we think we know, but not everyone is ready to do that. The US Scopes Monkey Trial in 1925 demanded that we allow the teaching of evolution in the classroom. It didn't demand that we teach evolution. 
it demands that we allow it to happen. There are still many classrooms in the United States where teachers just don't go near evolution because they don't want to deal with parents. But back in 1925, this was still a fairly new idea. And the argument was made that we need to allow it to be taught. And the, the debate for the science took place in the courtroom. And the battle was won to allow this to move forward. At the time, this was hugely controversial. And we didn't even know the details of, of evolution. Today, we're starting to understand the details. We're starting to be able to see in our own DNA in different peoples on the world, relics of prior versions of Homo sapien. For $99, any of us can get a basic genetic workup in the United States. I don't know if 23andMe has made it to other nations, but in the US, I can spit in a tube, and I have done this, and I can stick it in the US postal mail, send it off, and 23andMe will send back a detailed assessment of what my ancestry is. I, I know what percentage of my DNA can be linked to Neanderthals. I can tell where in Europe most of my family came from. I can see that even though my family claims to be Dutch and British, there's also, Anas I can't say this word, Anskasazi Jews. Thank you. That's how you say that word. It was gone for a moment. I, I can tell all of these things about myself from my genetics. And to me, this is amazing and liberating, and I'm willing to accept the diversity of my ancestry. But as much as I might wish that I lived in a non-racist modern world, the truth is, our ability to, to study genetics is something that is hard for some people to, to deal with because in reality, we still live in a world of hate and ignorance. There, there are those out there who base their self-worth on racist ideals of this people is superior to that people. These racists are now being challenged by facts. We, we are learning that one of the primary breast cancer genes, and I'm going to mispronounce this word again, is, is tied to Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. And many people had no idea that they had this in them. And now we're finding it. We, we are finding that many of the whitest looking racist men in the South actually had black African ancestry somewhere in their history. If if our self-worth is tied to our racist identity, what happens when we learn the truth? We are related to our so-called enemy. It's amazing what we can do with genetics. We can actually trace out, thanks to big data, how the cons came through Europe because they had many children. And so you can see in the mitochondrial DNA different lineages moving through the world. We can see how, how our ancestors stayed in one place, how they didn't, how we're all interrelated. Big data finally allows this thanks to genetics. But people cling to their racist identities, and big data challenges that. I would hope the truth would set us free, but the reality is Denial is easy, and we live in what people are beginning to call a post-factual world. Practicing denial is unfortunately easier than learning to love the other. It is easy for me, as I flip through Facebook, to be taken in by the false claims made about Republicans. Facebook has identified I'm a Democrat from how I behave on the internet. And so when people po post these false stories, I, because of the biases in the algorithms, in given false facts about Republicans, it will help me hate them more, because apparently that's what Facebook does. 
it's easier to practice hate than to learn love. As humans, we don't like to feel shame. We don't like to feel regret. We don't like to acknowledge our mistakes. Facing our own mistakes is one of the greatest struggles we deal with when facing certain data. Mistakes like the ones on Facebook we're learning shaped the elections. The amount of false data that was out there that told us one set of facts about Hillary Clinton if you were on one side of the algorithm, one set of facts about Donald Trump if you were on the other side of the algorithm. These changed how we acted. It changed the outcomes of our elections. We as humans were gamed, not by how people used facts, but how they made fictions appear as facts. And as was pointed out, we don't like to know we were lied to. And so people will try and find ways to say, no, 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 that ring of pedophiles in the pizza place in Washington, D.C. No, 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 that was true. And they'll show up with guns to kill the people who didn't exist. One of the most frequently asked questions I get is, how will it all end? And this is where we start to see how we deal with data shapes how we view the future. Early in my career, as I said, I got comfortable talking about how someday, perhaps, if the mass density of the universe is just right, we will expand out forever, and the universe will die by ice. Or perhaps, if the mass density is too high, the universe will collapse back in on itself, and we will essentially die by fire. Or perhaps, in the most boring of realities, everything is perfectly balanced out, and the universe, given the fullness of time, which will never actually come, will stop. Asymptotic relationships are fascinating. And, and I always turn to this poem, because I think it fits. Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if I had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. This is a way of looking at our universe and getting people to pull the emotions together, taking the data and making it more tangible. Today, data doesn't allow us the freedom of that poem that I gratuitously threw in. Today, the universe gives us actual answers. In the long term, the truth is sad. Here on Earth, we used to think, well, maybe the sun will blow it up and consume our planet. Maybe it won't. We now understand from mass loss rates. This is how much mass the sun gradually gives off through its solar winds, generating these beautiful aurora borealis you never see in Israel because you are too far south. But should you journey north, you'll see the sky illuminate with greens and reds. And what is ha happening is our sun is slowly giving off its mass. And sometimes it hits our atmosphere, interacts with the magnetic field. And the amount of mass it gives off determines our fate. If it gives off enough mass, our planet will migrate further and further away from the sun. And when the sun eventually bloats up as a red giant star, we will simply be well blackened and not actually consumed. Either way that the Earth meets its maker, we will not survive as a planet capable of, survive, of holding life. But our planet will still be here. Now, about the same time that this is happening, our, our galaxy will be colliding with the nearby Andromeda galaxy, becoming a new galaxy with a completely different shape. will be massive star formation driven by this. That's five billion years or so in the future. Now, looking beyond that, we now know from studying supernovae that our universe is not just expanding. It's accelerating apart. For reasons we don't fully understand, but we've given a name to because we can name things even if we don't understand them, there is this thing called dark energy that puts about three protons worth, worth of energy in every cubic meter of outer space. As the universe expands, this energy doesn't appear to be diluting. We just keep having this constant background energy. 
We don't know if it's actually an energy. We don't know if it's a pressure. We don't know if it's a force. We just named it dark energy, apparently to confuse people. Whatever it is, it's causing our universe to accelerate apart. There is going to be no big crunch. In fact, eventually the energy of the universe will be so spread out, so stretched out, that the structures of today will be lost. The black holes will evaporate. If particle physicists are right and protons decay, even the dead embers of stars will all decay away. And there'll be nothing but this diffuse background energy capable of supporting life nowhere. That's the fate of our universe. It's sad and it's beautiful. And for now, we have time. For now, we know here we are. Our planet will be here for a good five billion years before our sun expands and our galaxy collides. We have trillions of years before the heat death of the universe. But these are all numbers we don't really comprehend. It turns out human beings can't really comprehend numbers greater than 1,000. Yeah. I show you a picture. This is the standard explanation. I show you a picture of a football stadium. I don't care if it's American or European football. I show you a picture of a football stadium. If I tell you this stadium holds 60,000 people, you're like, OK, I'm good with that. I then tell you, no, 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 I lied. It actually only holds 30,000 people. You're like, hmm, why did you lie? But I can still see that. We can't look at something and comprehend tens of thousands. We can't comprehend millions. We can't comprehend trillions. It all sort of starts to become the same. And, and so it's easy for us to shrug off these concerns of the future. Even when the future we're talking about isn't billions or even millions of years in the future. At a certain point, we even have trouble dealing with 100 years in the future. Just as we constantly observe our sun, looking to understand mass loss, looking to understand when is the next solar flare going to wipe out the Canadian power grid as it has done in the past, just as we constantly study the stars and the universe beyond, we also constantly study our own planet Earth. And with this myriad of data we've managed to collect, we're able to derive a frightening understanding of our own future and our children's future. Man-made pollution, deforestation, and construction are all radically changing the surface of our planet. After the World Trade Center terrorist attack in 2001, US flight space was completely shut down. And we realized that having all of those airplanes flying over America is actually changing cloud formation, weather patterns. We've been able to realize, as cities have grown, as pavement has expanded, that these heat islands that we're creating are changing the weather. We're realizing that the pollution we give off that leaves a coating of soot across the snow is changing how that snow melts. We are changing our environment. We are changing how clouds come and go. We are changing how temperatures rise. We can measure the differences between how urban and rural areas retain heat. And now we have to try and figure out how do we fix it. Big data is giving us terrible consequences. And it's easier to deny what the data tells us than it is to accept the consequences. In Los Angeles, they've actually started in some areas as an experiment painting the pavement white to try and change how it retains heat. We're trying to figure out ways to lessen the effects of global warming. In, in Iceland, they've seen the terrible consequences of deforestation. We don't often think of Iceland when we think of deforestation. But it turns out the Vikings did a really good job 
of removing all of the trees. And it's a long-term experiment, whereas Brazil and the deforestation we so often think of there is a short-term experiment. They're actually in the process of trying to figure out how to bring topsoil back to Iceland. Because after all of the trees went away, turned into ships, masts, the topsoil began to blow off in the wind. And for the most part, there is no longer topsoil in Iceland. So they're planting trees, thousands of trees a year. But they estimate it will take 50 years before they're even able to get back 5% of the forests that were lost. We can measure our warming world. We can measure our rising seas. We can see the changes in the ocean temperatures and the weather patterns and the global averages. We don't often think about how interwoven our entire environment is. Our ocean is very carefully balanced. Its salinity allows it to have this amazing convective cell that carries the warm equatorial waters across the surface northward, allowing England to not be completely frozen all the time. This convection also brings the cold waters of the north down at lower depths to the equator. And this constant changing prevents massive hurricanes from forming. And it prevents massive cold fronts from taking over Europe. Except I should now say prevented. The salinity of our oceans is changing. As the North American ice sheets melt, we're adding too much fresh water to the sea. And this is going to have long-term consequences to the habitability of our world. It's going to be devastating to our economy. I have to admit, all of this data absolutely terrifies me. I don't actually know any planetary scientists who study atmospheres who have children. And that somewhat terrifies me more, because they're the ones who truly understand these details. Like everyone else, in a lot of ways, I, I want to deny these facts. I know I should never get Amazon Prime boxes. I do it all the time. It's easier to just shrug it away and say, humanity will find an answer. We will find a way to fix these things than to take personal responsibility for what the data is teaching me. And and I know I'm not the only one who just shrugs all of the results of the data off. And people shrug off things for many different reasons. I shrug it off mostly because of the hopelessness I feel. But there are others who shrug it off saying that global warming can't be real because God wouldn't let us destroy our planet like that. I've heard it argued that Armageddon second coming of Christ must occur before global warming can destroy our planet. So why do we need to act? I, I've heard it said, God will find a way to save our planet from whatever we do. We don't need to act. And every time I hear these arguments, it reminds me of this modern parable. I don't actually know the origins of this parable. Um, if any of you do know, Google failed me. I heard this for the first time on West Wing, but I know that's not its origins. The way it reads, um, let me remind you of a man that lived by the river. He heard a radio report that the river was going to rush up and flood the town, and all the residents should evacuate their homes. But the man said, I'm religious. I pray. God loves me. God will save me. The waters rose up. A guy in a rowboat came along and he shouted, hey, hey, you, you in there. The town is flooding. Let me take you to safety. But the man shouted back, I'm religious. I pray. God loves me. God will save me. A helicopter was hovering overhead. And a guy with a megaphone shouted, hey, you, you down there. The town is flooding. Let me drop this ladder and I'll take you to safety. But the man shouted back that he was religious, that he prayed that God loved him, and that God will take him to safety. Well, the man drowned. And standing at the gates of St. Peter, he demanded an audience with God. Lord, he said, I'm a religious man, I pray. I thought you loved me. Why did this happen? And God said, 
I sent you a radio report, a helicopter, and a guy in a rowboat. What the hell are you doing here? He sent you a priest, referring to the rest of the West Wing episode. In this episode, the president is struggling, and a priest has come to him, a rabbi has come to him, a Quaker has come to him, all offering him answers. And the president is upset that God has not given him revelation. We have to sometimes learn that revelation can come in the data. And we have to listen. We need to not be that man who ignored the radio, who ignored the man in the rowboat, who ignored the helicopter. We need to listen to all the voices that are bringing us the truth. And this is one of the struggles of big data, is sometimes we have to realize we live in a universe where we have been made such that we have the ability to comprehend. And if we choose to ignore what it is possible for us to comprehend, we're purposefully not seeing the truth. As long as I don't acknowledge the data, I can deny that my every Amazon Prime airmailed package is harming the planet. As long as I don't know the data, I can deny that buying oranges out of season is increasing the carbon in the atmosphere. As long as I don't know the data, I can eat any fish I want without worrying about the collapse of the oceans. But I do know, and climate change terrifies me. Big data can be our big brother, looking over our shoulder and informing us of our sins. It can be there monitoring not just our carbon footprint, but also almost everything from our water intake to our daily commute. How many of you have smart devices that constantly remind you to stand up, to move more, to breathe deeply? This is, I'm the youngest person in the room, I think, and I don't see any Apple Watches. This may be a unique audience that is not constantly monitoring their own behaviors, and this parable just fell flat. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so, so a few of you. Um, so have you heard of smart cities? Utrecht in the Netherlands has started an experiment where they have installed across the city microphones and cameras and Wi-Fi monitoring data points. That as you move across the city, whether you realize it or not, unless you turn the Wi-Fi in your phone off, your phone is constantly going, is there Wi-Fi I recognize? Is there Wi-Fi I recognize? And they can track your movements through Utrecht, through the hardware address of your phone. They monitor the behaviors of teenagers, looking to see who groups together, who is most likely to be truant, who is most likely to get into trouble. They consider this a way of doing youth intervention. They monitor the behaviors of the city, looking for sound patterns that indicate we should maybe get police to this area before we actually need to get police to the area. It's predictive policing. It's not the only city in the world. It's just perhaps one of the most Western cities in the world that's doing this. With smart cities, we must ask ourselves, how much of our privacy do we dare give up in the name of safety? Is it right to monitor our movements through our phones, MAC addresses? Is it right to listen in on the conversations of our teens and to monitor who's hanging out with whom to figure out who is most likely to be selling drugs? The TV show Black Mirror asks us this kind of a question over and over and over by presenting cautionary tales. If you've never watched Black Mirror, I strongly encourage you to do so. It confronts us with the possible consequences of di big data. For instance, where do we draw the line in monitoring our children? Is it right to monitor their positions with their phones, which a lot of parents do now? What about looking through the laptop's web cameras? 
This is a case that arose in the United States where a school was providing children with laptops and would turn on the cameras to monitor the children's behavior. It was actually discovered that some of the teachers were watching the laptops to see if the children were naked. There's multiple things to be concerned about in all of these tales. Where do we draw the line in monitoring our sit industry? Should we demand mental illnesses be logged in national databases? This is, again, a concern we have in the US currently with gun, gun regulations. <sighs> what about significant diseases? Should all of them be monitored as well? We can tell more than we think about from how we behave. The way you shop gets used to understand things about you. Target back in 2012 got in significant problems because their algorithms got so good at looking to see what people are purchasing and figuring out how that predicted, are they going to get married, are they going to have children, that the algorithms could tell someone who was pregnant before the person necessarily knew or the family knew. It turns out that a pregnant woman is going to binge purchase unscented lotion. It's something that simple, that change in your behavior. And big data allows us to see these trends. In China, they're actually starting to use this in truly terrifying ways. Um, I'm going to read a quote from the Japanese Times. The data are collected under the Integrated Joint Operations Protocol with pools of information from individuals' bank records, legal past, computer details, and other sources including security camera footage. According to the people HRW interviewed, some of those targeted or detained are sent to extra-legal political education centers where they are held indefinitely without charge or trial. In China, they are looking to see how you act, what you say, who you communicate with, and how you spend your money. And if the government disapproves, you are sent off to be reprogrammed. Big data allows us to know our future as a planet. And we have to decide how do we act on it. Big data allows computers to sometimes know our futures. Are we pregnant? Are we not? How are we starting to behave? You can even start to see Alzheimer's in changes in word usage. It turns out that Terry Pratchett's Alzheimer's was initially diagnosed because the vocabulary that he used in writing his books became more simplistic. And now, as we have so many people blogging, so many people constantly writing their information onto the internet, we can start to see various mental decay just in how we write. But should we? I, I don't know the answers to all of these questions. I'm, I'm an astronomer. I, I see what can be done. I see the consequences. I see the questions that we need to ask. And one of the concerns that I have looking at this is a lot of the things that we find in the data are, are geared at finding the ways that people are bad, that people are evil. They're there to try and figure out how do we protect ourselves from these diagnosed evil doers from the data. But the other side of big data is it's allowing us to see that people often are good if they're given the opportunity, thanks to technology, to be good. We have the ability, thanks to the internet, to share our stories. And thanks to some platforms, we also have the ability to fund innovation, to fund creativity, and to take part in things that are greater than ourselves. We're seeing through Kickstarter, India, go, go, go fund me that people will choose to find creativity, choose to find doing amazing things. But rather than just spending money on good, they will also choose to participate in doing good. And, 
And this is where the idea of citizen science comes in, which you brought up with Galaxy Zoo, and with a lot of different big data problems out there. We have terabytes upon terabytes upon terabytes of data raining down on us from all of the satellites and spacecraft that are orbiting our planet and exploring our solar system. And it turns out computer vision is not yet good enough to know what to make of this data. <laughs> to look at just the moon, which is something that I've been working on studying for the past few years. We, we want to send rovers to it. We want to send humans to it. We would ourselves, in a few cases, not me, but I suspect some of you would like at some point to go to the moon. But our maps of the moon are only accurate down to three kilometer resolution. And if you're a little tiny rover, you need better than three kilometer resolution or you're going to fall into a giant crater and die. And, and there are actually folks here in Israel, Space IL is one of the final programs for uh, the Google Lunar X Prize. And even though the Google Lunar X Prize was canceled a few weeks ago, Space IL is continuing their plans to launch and explore the surface of the moon. Now, since we only have low resolution maps, we would like to be able to program software to explore, explore the moon for us. But the sun constantly changes its position in the sky. And it turns out moving shadows, shadows boggle computer vision. The moon has soils of a myriad of different colors. In some places, when you hit the moon with a rock, by which I mean an asteroid, it splatters white dust everywhere on a dark surface. Other places, it splatters dark dust on a light surface. Other places, it's all the same color dirt going splat everywhere. These variations in soil composition, soil texture, soil color, these changes in the sun's position, all of these things mean that our best algorithms in the world are only about 80% accurate. And if you're a little baby rover, you need better than 80% accuracy if you want to survive as a little baby rover. Now the imagery that we have is good to a half meter per pixel. This means that if most of the people in the room lay down on the moon and assumed the snow angel position, we could see you on the surface of the moon. We have the data to create the hazard maps, to map out the safe places to land and the scientifically interesting places to explore. And if you put this data online, it turns out there are hundreds of thousands of volunteers willing to use their spare time drawing circles on images to mark out where the craters are. They'll just sit there on their sofa drawing circles, drawing circles. <laughs> It's about the most boring thing a human being can do, in my opinion, and this is my research. But volunteers do it because it's important and because they want to be part of telling the story of science. And if you give people the opportunity to help, people the opportunity to be part of something greater than themselves, to be part of transforming this big data that we can tell nothing from into big data that is understanding, they will come and they will help and they will participate. As we move into this week's discussions, I, I would ask all of you to come at big data with a scientist's eyes. When the data reveals a new truth, we need to find flexibility in our worldview. We need to take our beliefs out of a box and allow them to expand to encompass the true awesomeness of our universe and the smallness of our pale blue dot in the darkness of space. As we explore the limits of what technology offers and not just what is possible, but also what is fair and what is moral, we need to ask what choices set us up to be free and to be our best selves? And what choices actually put us on a path to that dystopian future that comes in so many science fiction books? We are at a turning point. How we choose to use data, how we choose to use all this information that is available about ourselves, about our universe, 
how we choose to use it will allow us to either save ourselves or lose ourselves into a post-factual age. I'm an astronomer. I, I can't tell you how we save society. I can tell you that our Earth will be here for five billion more years. With or without us, the planet doesn't care. I can tell you that our world is just one of countless worlds in our galaxy. We know of tens of thousands of potential worlds out there. <sighs> Due to the vastness of space, though, we are essentially alone. We can't get to those other worlds, not in any way that allows one human to make that journey. It is up to us to find our own way forward and to find our way forward without losing our humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, everybody will now adjourn to lunch at the uh, Greg Cafe uh, restaurant, which is just a minute walk from here. Uh, will you please uh, follow Elissa uh, to the, uh, the restaurant? And we will meet back here at um, uh, 10 past 2 to start the next session. We could just save some of our laptops and stuff. Yes,